Well, good afternoon, everyone. The National Assembly for Wales is now in session. And the first item this afternoon are questions to the First Minister. And question one is Mick Antony. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, will the First Minister make a statement on the state of industrial relations in Wales? Yes, uh, so I understand you've given your permission for questions one and five to be grouped. Yes. Well, the Welsh Government encourages uh, good industrial relations in Wales and works in social partnership with employers and trade unions to support this. Well, thank you for that answer. And First Minister, we can be, I think, uh, proud of the good and constructive industrial relations that we've developed within Wales, the partnerships that have been formed over many decades. And, of course, the trade union bill going through Westminster seeks to undermine that, that good work. We have a situation in England where you even have junior doctors now uh, balloting for industrial action. First Minister, do you think there is much that uh, the UK Government could learn from the positive experience we have had from uh, Welsh Government within Wales? Yes, indeed they can. It's, it's appalling what's being proposed in the Trade Union Bill and I can say to the Assembly that we will be doing all that we can in order to make sure that where we believe there is a, a devolution question, we will pursue that uh, in terms of public services in, in Wales. Uh, and if, if we can, uh, we will seek to oppose that parts of the Trade Union Bill that affect all public services. Uh, in relation to the junior doctors uh, issue, that is a sign of the sorry state that the NHS is in in England and the way it is being managed. Quinn Price. Thank you, Sloward. First Minister, you'll be aware that Caerphilly County Borough Council have passed a motion opposing the UK's trade union bill. Will you join me in sharing their concerns about the adverse impact this bill will have on the Welsh workers' rights? Absolutely. It's a straightforward attack on workers' rights. I'd encourage other uh, councils to follow uh, Caerphilly's lead because we know that this is all about trying to uh, strip people of their rights in work to try and make it more difficult for them to uh, join a trade union and it is in that sense a fundamental attack on rights and democracy. Thank you. First Minister, you will be aware of the current dispute between the PCS union and the West government sponsored body National Museum Wales. The dispute is about a number of issues including senior management's proposal to remove premium payments for weekend working, which make up, makes up between 12 to 15 percent of the take-home pay of front-of-house staff. Will the First Minister tell us how National Museum Wales' refusal to look at the alternative proposals suggested by PCS fit in with his government wish to promote positive industrial relations in Wales? Is he really trying to present himself and his party as the defender of the workers? Uh, well, that's something that uh, certainly uh, welcome, but certainly his party has spent nothing, uh, but uh, nothing else, uh, done nothing else in the past few months that attack the rights of workers, both in Wales and the UK. We're aware of the ongoing dispute between the National Museum uh, and indeed uh, their workers. It's a matter for them to resolve, but we encourage employers and trade unions to work constructively to resolve those issues affecting the workplace, rather than trying to undermine trade unions, which is what the Tories want to do. Bethan Jenkins. First Minister, I wanted to come in on that issue because I have been working very closely with the PCS on the National Museum dispute, especially on the premium payments at weekends. And at the demonstration I spoke at a few weeks ago, we were told that Edwina Hart, um, with the Minister responsibility in this area, would be talking to trade unions. So I wonder, in the nature of having that constructive discussion, what you have talked to them about in order to try and reach an agreement here so that Wales can be shown um, as a positive light when we are embarking on the discussions with regards to the trade union bill. On a UK level? Well, well I haven't personally uh, spoken to either unions or the employer in this uh, dispute, but uh, I will ask the, uh, the Minister to write to you with further details as, as to uh, what has been done in the light of the, the comments that you've illustrated. Russell George. Uh, First Minister, we've heard um, mention of the National uh, Museum of Wales, but can I ask you uh, what do you think the government's role is uh, in resolving industrial disputes when they occur at third party organisations when they're sponsored by the Welsh Government? Well, I can say one thing that we are not uh, doing, and that is wrecking trade union rights. At the end of the day, there should be discussion between employers and trade unions. We see from the Conservative Party an attempt not just to remove the rights of workers, but to destroy trade unions, because it's inconvenient uh, for them. That's why they shout about it, because they know, because in shouting, they show their shame. We know that. So, no, we uh, recognise trade unions. Uh, we look to uh, work with trade unions, and we have a record of doing that. It's a shame the UK government prefers conflict to consensus. We know no question two, John Griffiths. Will the First Minister make a statement on the regeneration of city centres? 
Yes, our flagship uh, regeneration programme, uh, Vibrant and Viable Places, supports town and city regeneration uh, in many areas across Wales. First Minister, Vibrant and Viable Places has seen a strong partnership in Newport between the City Council, Welsh Government, the private sector and the third sector, and is delivering some £60 million of regeneration with new accommodation, new public services cited in the city centre, as well as much other associated development. On Thursday, of course, First Minister, I know you will be helping to open the Friars Walk retail development in Newport, which is a further example of what I believe is very impressive city centre regeneration. Will you join me in looking forward to Thursday's opening and the fact that Newport is showing a very strong example of how you take forward city centre redevelopment and regeneration? Yes, it's an excellent example of a Labour-led council helping to uh, redevelop uh, the city centre of Newport, John Frost Square particularly. I know that there are already a number of retail units that have, uh, or retail companies, that have already signed up to being in the centre. Now, whilst, of course, we haven't provided direct funding for the scheme, uh, we have been involved <coughs> in site assembly and pre-project assessment support uh, and facilitation through support uh, delivered through Newport Unlimited. It's a good example of government working together and a Labour Council delivering. William Graham. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Will the First Minister not acknowledge, of course, <coughs> that during the previous Conservative administration in Newport was actually what brought forward the last amount of money absolutely vital to make this important development take place in Newport, which is vital to the future of the city? Well, what we saw in the previous administration was prevarication. What we see under this administration is delivery. Lindsay Whittle. Thanks. Uh, well, first of all, we all welcome the Friars Walk development in Newport and developments uh, in other major cities, but we, we do, do need more Welsh uh, government's efforts to help regenerate uh, nearby town centres and in the South Wales Valleys. And I'm wondering, uh, has any research uh, been undertaken as to the impact of these major developments in cities on the adjoining uh, and feeding valley towns, please? Uh, no, but I know that uh, there's been, uh, I mean, assessments have to be made when a large out-of-town retail centre uh, is proposed and the effect particularly on a town centre uh, around which that retail centre might be based uh, and uh, that is something that, that uh, planning authorities should consider as they give permission for large-scale developments. But there's no doubt that where you have large out-of-town shopping centres that there is an effect on town centres. We see it in Bridgend, where I live, we've seen it in Llanelli at the moment and yet we see other examples like Carmarthen where uh, Debenhams is in the town centre and that's helped to uh, invigorate the uh, town centres. So there's a lot to be learned in, uh, in the future in terms of making sure uh, that if there are to be large-scale developments that they are located as close to city centres as possible and not in areas where they simply draw people away from, from city and town centres and make them less viable. Elena Parrott. Uh, Josh Lowe, First Minister, one of the best ways of making sure that our city centres are vibrant is making sure that the existing small independent businesses are able to stay in business uh, there. But yes, I've had reports from Cardiff of the uh, City Council being very aggressive in pursuing uh, business rates arrears from independent traders and particularly um, not using the hardship uh, provisions that are within their powers um, adequately for those businesses who are having struggling times. I wonder if you would agree to conduct a review of the use of the hardship provisions within the business rate system to see how they are being applied across Wales to ensure that our small traders can uh, continue to, to stay in business. Yeah, I will write to the member on that. She, she raises a point that needs to be looked at and I will do that. We now move to questions of the party leaders and first this afternoon, Leader of the Opposition, Andrew R.T. Davis. Yeah. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. First Minister, could I welcome your U-turn on Cabinet decision reports that you are now going to start to republish? Uh, and with that in mind about transparency, uh, last week on the Jason Mohammed show, you said that the uh, M4 Black Route could be delivered way below the billion pounds that various consultants had identified being the cost of constructing of, of that route. Uh, what access have you had to new information that gives you such confidence to talk of it being delivered way below the figure that is commonly understood as being the cost of that project? As we've always said, it will not cost uh, that figure and will come in below that. The next question, no doubt, is what is the figure? We, we're not going to release the figure publicly. That's the equivalent of showing your cars in a poker game because we will have companies tendering uh, for the uh, contracts to build the M4 if it gets to that stage, uh, as is our plan, uh, and uh, revealing beforehand what your target figure is. is not a, your target figure is, is not a wise move in the world of business. 
I fu fully understand that, and there will be a parameter that you'll be working in, surely. And for you to go out and say that the figure will be way below the billion pound figure that the, the government's own consultants, Arup, have brought forward, and they've had six million pounds uh, paid by the Welsh government to them to commission the costings around this project, surely leads to the question: What new information you, you as first minister, have? that gives you the confidence to come out and talk about this major infrastructure investment, most probably the biggest infrastructure investment that this government or a future Welsh government will make, that you can have with confidence be able to say is going to come way below that billion pounds. I mean, you surely can give us a taste of the information that's been given to you and the type of ballpark parameters that you're working in. No, based on the information that I have before me, uh, coming below that, as I said, I'm not prepared to release a figure because, as I said, all that does is give an indication to those who might tender uh, what their successful tender might be, and uh, that is something that we cannot do in the commercial world. It's sad that you're being so evasive on this, First Minister. In a recent opposition debate, the Minister of the Economy indicated that 160 staff members were working on this project from within her department. That's a quarter of her department are working on this particular project. The First Minister has come out now on the radio and in previous press quotes and said that the figure is going to be substantially below what most people thought was the accurate figure that was provided to the Welsh Government by, by surveyors who were commissioned by yourself and paid by yourself. It's not unreasonable to ask for clarity around these figures and around these numbers when so much effort of the Welsh Government in civil service time has been put into it. And ultimately, you could actually gain more support for the project if you could be more transparent in the remarks that you were making. So I ask you again, not asking you to pinpoint the figure, but to say to us today what new information has come forward that gives you confidence to say that the figure is way below. Are we talking hundreds of millions or tens of millions? Now, I know his party is riven in half by this, uh, by this <laughs> issue. There. We've heard different views uh, on this. Uh, but what I can say is that I stand by what I said and what I've said before. He himself, uh, as in the, in the preamble to his second question, said that he understood that you cannot reveal a figure. And in reveal, the world please. of business, that isn't going to happen. All I can say is it'll, it, that uh, it, we expect it to come in below the figure of one billion. Actually putting a figure to it at this stage, of course it'll become uh, obvious in time to come, of course it will, because people will see what the figure is. But to actually say to any potential tenderer, this is the figure that we're looking to, uh, uh, to offer, is just an invitation for everybody to come in with the same figure. That makes no sense commercially. We now move to the leader of the Welsh Liberal Democrats, Kirsty Williams. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, yesterday I showed a group of children from Craddock Primary School around the Assembly. When asked who the Assembly belongs to, one child replied, the government. Wrong, said the visitor tour manager. This building belongs to you. If this building does indeed belong to the people, isn't it shameful that Labour have vetoed the BBC and ITV from filming a behind-the-scenes documentary in this assembly? That is not a government decision. That's a matter for the Labour group who took the decision. Uh, First Minister, uh, I'm, well, I'm well aware it was a matter of the Labour group. When I want to find out the views of the Labour Party, I'll write to Nia Griffiths. I'm asking you as First Minister whether you think it's regrettable. But let me move on. And let's turn to your disgraceful decision and your subsequent U-turn to stop publishing ministerial decision reports on your government website. Considering that you have now done that, will you now apologise for the ludicrous comments by your spokesperson yesterday that accused my party of wasting government resources when all we were doing was scrutinising your government, which after all is what an opposition party is meant to do? Well, I would have thought that the leader of the Liberal Democrats would uh, welcome today's decision. I've been looking at it for some time. Uh, this is something that we do uh, to see whether the original decision was correct. Uh, I took the decision that we had to uh, reintroduce a system where it was possible to see where the decisions were uh, and a brief explanation of what those decisions were as well. And that is something that we will continue to do now from now on. Uh, I do indeed uh, welcome the decision, First Minister, and given that you're in listening mode and are particularly interested, it seems, this week in transparency <coughs> and openness, and now that you've admitted that you've got it wrong on ministerial, dis ministerial decision reports, would you now commit to bringing forward proposals to fully open the doors of government by publishing details of meetings between you, your ministers and officials, with lobbyists and external pressure groups? 
Uh, and could I say that it is not the, our policy to meet with lobbyists. It is not our policy as ministers to meet routinely with, with pressure groups, uh, certainly our professional lobbyists. Uh, and can I also say that in terms of transparency, uh, that is something we're fully aware of. We are accountable to the people of Wales. And we know, of course, uh, that the Liberal Democrats understand this full well following the result of the general election. We now move to the lead reply. Can we, Leanne Wood? Dear Llywydd, <coughs> First Minister, do you agree with me that the key to an eff effective inspectorate in healthcare is that it's sufficiently uh, resourced and enjoys full freedom to pursue the interests of patients? Full freedom, yes. Resourcing, yes. Bearing in mind the... Uh, financial squeeze that we have received from the UK government. It is probably right to say we, were not, we are not able to resource every single aspect of government as we would want to. Thank you for that answer, First Minister, and you may well be aware of the evidence given this morning to the Public Accounts Committee where the Health Inspectorate Wales Chief Executive was asked if she felt her organisation was adequately resourced, and she answered, I think the answer to that would have to be no. I would like to do more. Would you accept that what she says is correct, First Minister? I'm sure all organisations would like to do more, including the, uh, the government itself. There's no suggestion, of course, that uh, HIW are unable to fulfil the functions that uh, are delegated to them. Well, First Minister, the Health Committee first raised its concerns about the staffing and the resourcing of Health Inspectorate Wales 18 months ago, and the revelation this morning in committee suggests that you've not taken sufficient steps to deal with that. Now, how can patients have full confidence that their interests and concerns are being properly furthered when the <coughs> inspectorate body is not being properly financed and you've just accepted that it's not being properly resourced. Now, several scandals of poor care have emerged in recent years and the inspectorate itself has admitted that it's not had full sight of all patient complaints. When will Labour finally deliver a properly resourced health inspectorate? And is it not time now, First Minister, that that inspectorate was independent of government? Well, the inspectorate is independent of government. Uh, as, and in fact, the, the, what you've just said is an illustration of that. Uh, if the inspector was, was not independent of government, you wouldn't have um, somebody using those words, but, but resourcing. They would feel in, under some pressure uh, to give the answer they felt the government wanted to hear. That's not what happened uh, this morning. Now, is it the, the case that the inspectorate cannot carry out the functions that it has? The answer to that is no, I don't believe that. They are carrying out more and more inspections, and rightly so, because that's what uh, people uh, expect. And I have no doubt that uh, where they, they wish to, they can bid for more resources in the future. But bearing in mind, of course, the squeeze there's been on public finances since 2010. Question three, <coughs> sorry, we now move back to questions on the paper, and question three is Darren Miller. Thank you, Presiding <coughs> Officer. Will the First Minister make a statement on the future of the National Health Service in North Wales? Yes, the uh, Deputy Minister made a statement on the next steps on supporting the improvement programme at Betsy Cadwallader on the 4th of November. First Minister, one of the symptoms of some of the problems <coughs> in North Wales uh, that emerged uh, in that health board area were large volumes of complaints about particular services. But we heard in the Public Accounts Committee, as already been alluded to this morning, from the Healthcare Inspectorate, who said that they do not routinely receive uh, information on complaints uh, from either community health councils or the boards themselves prior to undertaking uh, inspections or scoping their, uh, their work. Is that a concern to you? And what action will you take to ensure that the gold mine of information that is within the complaint system is available and routinely accessed as part of the inspection regime. Well, that's surprising. I know that with regard to never events, for example, that they are publicised in a way that was never the case uh, before. Uh, Healthcare Inspectorate Wales are part of the, um, the process in terms of making sure that Bessie Cadwallader uh, regains public confidence. There was a meeting on the 21st of October between senior government officials the Wales Audit Office and the Healthcare Inspectorate, and they are part of the, uh, the process of reviewing uh, progress as the, uh, the local health board moves uh, forward. Uh, however, if it is the case that this is not, not routinely done in terms of information being shared with the Healthcare Inspectorate, I will investigate in the right of the member. Claire Griffiths. Uh, with. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, many of us were surprised somewhat that Better Get Well Health Board had spent a few million pounds on external management consultants recently and that that had happened 
in contracts, some of them worth hundreds of thousands of pounds, without a competitive tendering process. 11 of the 12 contracts were laid without competition. Do you think that that's acceptable? And if you don't, then do you intend to look into the issue? Well, of course, it, it is very important that there is a proper tendering system. And, but sometimes, of course, it is cheaper to get somebody in temporarily as a consultant rather than employing somebody permanently. And that's how it is. Uh, that's how things are done in England and also in Scotland. But we would expect the health boards to be open about how much money they are spending and also to be open and to tender where that is possible. Thank you, Sandy Mewis. Thank you, presiding officer. Will the First Minister make a statement on the importance of economic links between North Wales and North West of England? Yes, we do recognise the importance of economic links between the North of Wales and the North West of, of England. Uh, we do continue to support the Mersey D Alliance in their work to strengthen cross-border relationships, particularly in relation to identifying potential economic benefits for both regions. Uh, thank you for that. Um, our Welsh Labour Government has been leading the way, in actual fact, in promoting the important economic links which you've already mentioned by engaging with the Mersey D Alliance, improving the A55 and working to improve rail links between Wrexham and Chester. It has established a partnership approach between the two regions, uh, seeing a northern powerhouse as an opportunity rather than as a competitor. So do you agree that it is vital that the UK government shows the same level of commitment by ensuring North Wales is fully linked into the Northern Powerhouse Initiative by playing its part in delivering improved connections between the two regions? Well, I, I think the Secretary of State, late though he was to the discussion, uh, was not correct when he said that Manchester was a competitor. I think there's great scope for the north of Wales and the northwest of England to work together. The reality is, it is it's an economic region. There's a, a lot of cross-border flow, uh, as is normal in, in many other countries in uh, in Europe, uh, and uh, that is something that we seek to facilitate and uh, to improve for the benefit of those in the northwest of England and in the north of Wales. Uh, it would be useful, certainly, to see further commitment with regard to electrification, Rex and Bidston, the Borderlands Line, and also, of course, the North Wales Main Line, where there are no plans to electrify at the moment. Janet Howard. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, the Secretary of State for Wales was in North Wales yesterday, highlighting to business organisations how important the Northern Powerhouse project in North West England could be to the North Wales economy. Could you outline what discussions your government has had with the Secretary of State to ensure that North Wales maximises the benefits that a successful Northern Powerhouse could bring to us? I was aware that the Secretary of State uh, was in uh, the north of Wales. He, uh, it was a week after me uh, when I spoke in Wrexham and said exactly the same thing as he did. Uh, he simply copied what I'd said. <laughs> but there we are. It's, um, I suppose his imitation is a serious form of, uh, of flattery. I've not had direct discussions with the Secretary of State on this, but certainly through our work with the Mersey D Alliance uh, and our discussions with businesses in the northeast of Wales particularly, we have emphasised what we want to see in terms of making sure that there is uh, greater prosperity cross-border and that's something of course that through the North Wales Economic Ambition Board uh, we are promoting through the Mersey D Alliance we are promoting uh, and uh, it's um, good to see the Secretary of State coming in behind us. Thank you presiding officer the railway of course is a very important part of the cross-border links does the first minister agree with me that we must ensure that decisions taken by the UK government on the future of the railway should reflect the fact that services from North Wales to towns in the northwest of England are crucial services for people living in North Wales and that those services therefore shouldn't we be taken out of the Wales and Borders franchise? Well, yes, we have figures at the moment that indicate that Wales received less than 1% of the rail improvement funding from Network Rail over the past few years. There hasn't been any improvement as regards the North Wales rail lines, apart uh, from the Nant Conway line and the line on the... Uh, border between Wrexham and Bidston. And therefore, our view as a uh, Welsh Government is that the Welsh Government would be in a better position to deal or to manage the funding of uh, the railways in Wales, but that is not the view of the UK Government at present. Five was grouped with question one, so we move to question six, and that's Beth and Jenkins. 
What discussion has the Welsh Government had with the UK Government regarding emissions at Aberthaw Power Station? Well, we do maintain a dialogue with the UK Government in respect of all key business sectors, including the energy supply industry. Thank you. When I met with RWE uh, a while back, they said that the Welsh Government had provided an official to act in an intermediary role between the company and the European Union, um, whose job, as it was described to me, was to try and avoid the issue going to court. Um, clearly, that has happened now, and a lot of open cast mines in South Wales rely upon Aberthaw as a customer. Um, has your official that has been uh, designated to look at this issue had any indication from RWE of what will happen if the legal action goes against the company? Company. Uh, will it close Aberthaw, for example, and what will that mean for open cast mines across South Wales? I think it's right to say uh, that if the litigation goes against Aberthaw, it will make it more difficult for Aberthaw to operate, and that is bound to have an effect on its viability in the long term. The same is true of open cast mining, I suspect, as well, given the, uh, the supply chain that exists there. J just to inform the member, that, that, uh, as she said, the infraction case is now in the litigation phase. The defence, the UK's defence, that is was submitted to the court by the UK Government in September. The Commission has since submitted a reply to the court, so the UK now has until the 2nd of December to submit a rejoinder to the court, uh, and to that end, Welsh Government officials are working with UK Government officials and legal counsel on this issue. So we, we have a role, but of course, uh, in, legally, uh, the uh, dispute is between the Commission on the one hand and the UK Government on the other. David Rees. First Minister, emissions from power stations have always been a major concern for the impact on communities and the air quality in the areas around those power stations. Uh, the recent announcement that Cinephotone has actually purchased the former Energy Biomass power plant in Patalba, in my constituency, has raised concerns amongst my constituents, again, about the impact it will have on the air quality within the town, and we already know the issues in the town in relation to the industrial heritage there. Will the Welsh Government meet with the new developers to seek assurances that emissions from any development will not actually deteriorate further the air quality in Patalba? Well, we, we would not wish to see that, nor we expect that. It is a matter, of course, for NRW to, uh, to monitor uh, emissions. Uh, we know that improving air quality is a key objective for us as a government. It's right to say our air is cleaner now in overall terms than at any time since the Industrial Revolution, but there is room for further improvement. So in 2013, we did issue a short-term action plan to tackle PM10 particle levels in the uh, Neath Potobot uh, area. And I can say that Welsh Government officials do meet regularly with industry operators, with NRW, and also with the uh, Neath Potobot County Borough Council uh, in order to uh, seek uh, solutions to reduce the level of PM10s in Neathport Talbot. We would not want, nor would we expect, air quality to deteriorate. Susie Davis. Uh, Diolch, uh, uh, well, of course, the, the owners of Aberthaw Power St Station, RWE Group, has been at the heart of a, a couple of controversial applications in South Wales West in recent years. Uh, obviously, they're seeking um, EU funding uh, for the power station with a, an unusual record, shall we say, at the moment. And, of course, they continue to push for a wind farm on Manitha Guire uh, in the face of concerted civil, op uh, uh, civil opposition. Now, I appreciate that the role of Welsh Government is different in both those cases, but how does your government weigh up and emphasise considerable public disapproval of any particular project, uh, first in uh, its role when it's limited to making representations to UK Government, and secondly, when it's actually the role of this government to make a decision? Well, the, uh, the issue of public opinion is, imp is a, a factor in terms of a decision being uh, made, that much is true. But, of course, the uh, technical advice notes and planning policy guidance Wales are also important documents in that regard. Uh, but I have to say, uh, the UK government has to decide what it actually wants to do with power generation. It's against onshore wind. Uh, it's not helping in terms of tidal energy. We're hearing nothing about the tidal lagoon. That seems to have gone to sleep as far as the UK government are concerned. Uh, they are keen to promote nuclear. We've seen that with the enormous loan they've given uh, with regard to uh, Hinkley Point. But there is no coherent overall energy policy being put forward by the UK government. We don't know where energy will come from in the next decade. And, of course, we're not seeing help for high energy users, such as the steel industry. We have called and called and called for the steel industry to have uh, the respect from the UK government that it deserves to make sure that the energy costs that are hampering the steel industry in Wales and elsewhere to be addressed. But so far, the UK government has done nothing. Question seven, Rina Bjorwith. Will the First Minister make a statement on North Wales Railways? Well, I answered this question to some extent earlier. I asked a question earlier on the next franchise and the 
First Minister didn't answer that question, but I'm sure I can continue that discussion with the Minister for Transport. I will, however, now turn to investment in infrastructure. There will be a very important meeting held in Llandidno this Thursday to discuss the electrification of the North Wales line. I'm very pleased that the Government and Plaid Cymru is part of a consensus on the need to proceed with electrification as a crucial step towards connectivity for the people of Wales, none more perhaps than the people of Anismon who are at the end of the line and it's an important link to Ireland as well, of course. To what extent, however, is the First Minister willing to intervene personally to try and persuade the UK government to put electrification of the North Wales main line as a priority when it comes to rail infrastructure? Because whilst we agree that the powers and decisions should be taken in Wales, that's not the case at the, pr- the moment. Well, what concerns me greatly, of course, is that we now understand that the Department of Transport in London uh, has be received cuts of 30 per cent. And I don't see how that works as regards ensuring that the whole network will be modernised and improved. Having said that, of course, electrification of the North Wales main line is something that I've mentioned publicly a number of times and we don't even know about the South Wales main line uh, at the moment that has been promised by the UK government but without any start date I'm concerned of course that if we don't see the electrification of the line to North Wales then the intercity line will actually terminate in crew and that is why that is where electrification ends at the present time and that is not what we want to see and we're still bringing pressure to bear on the UK government to electrify not just the south but also North Wales and also some of the railways such as the Marches line. Yay. Chief Presiding Officer, First Minister, as a result of the withdrawal of three service routes in Wales, I understand that the DFT are actually uh, providing compensatory funding to the Welsh Government. Could you advise us how much this funding is? And also, can you confirm that you'll be rolling this money back into the rail service in Wales in order uh-huh. to bring about some much-needed improvements? No, I'm not, we're not aware of what the, uh, the, the funding will be at this moment in, uh, in time. Uh, we want to invest more in our rail network. As I say, I don't see how that chimes with the 30% cut announced today in funding for the Department for Transport uh, in, uh, in, in Whitehall. Uh, and I do worry that we are now seeing a delay in the electrification of the South Wales main line. Uh, we cannot move ahead with electrification of the, uh, of the metro without the main line being done. But thus far, we are not being given a date. Uh, and until that is done, then the promise that was made by her party will remain unfulfilled. Tell us when the main line in South Wales will be electrified. That's a simple question. Thus far, we have no answer. Alan Roberts. Uh- Thank you, Presiding Officer. There is a risk, of course, that the railway in North Wales, as you've said, would be disconnected from the wider UK network if it is not electrified. But there was a statement yesterday on further delays in the link between Wrexham and Chester. The Welsh Government plan and also problems in terms of the line between Gobowen and Shrewsbury, which is funded by the Welsh Government. Have you, therefore, submitted any complaints as part of the UK government's review into Network Rail to state how dissatisfied you are as a government with the way that Network Rail is operating at present? Yes, we've done so a number of times. Although we have the powers to fund the work and the services, we don't actually manage or control that. It's Network Rail and a number of times that uh, should be managed within Wales as it as is the case in Scotland, in, to ensure that the people of Wales have complete control over the railway as we have, uh, as they have elsewhere. We've seen problems arising, such as the closing the Seven Tunnel when there's a, a major match on in Cardiff, and that demonstrates that we need more powers in Wales over the railways of Re- Wales. Will the First Minister provide an update on Welsh Government policies for support in the farming community? Yes, our upcoming strategic framework for agriculture and our ambitious new initiatives under the Welsh Government Rural Communities Rural Development Programme, such as the Sustainable Production Grant and Farming Connect, will put the farming community on the best possible footing for the future. Uh, Thank you, First Minister. I recently visited Monmouthshire's livestock market, uh, and there's an invitation uh, open to you from the farmers to visit uh, the same market to hear their concerns. There are ongoing concerns about the Welsh Government's changes to the basic payment scheme, 
which will see many lowland farmers in my constituency and, and others lose out as a consequence of the transition to a flat rate. Now, I appreciate things do change, uh, but within this new scheme, there is no recognition of the benefits of production. There's no account taken of the fact that upland animal densities are far lower than in the lowlands. Isn't the basic problem here, Minister, that the new scheme does not actually favour farmers who actually want to farm? Well, upland farmers would find that uh, a very difficult uh, line, I have to say, that he said. The reality is that, that lowland farmers and upland farmers are in a different position in this regard. Uh, there are plenty of farmers who don't agree with that view, and I met farmers who do. Uh, now, if it's the case that upland farmers are less valued than lowland farmers, I have to say to him I would disagree uh, with that uh, viewpoint. I know that upland farming is an important contributor to sustainability, not just in terms of economic sustainability, but social and environmental sustainability uh, in, in Wales. And let's face it, the greatest risk to farming is the loss of the European market. Because if farmers don't have easy and unrestricted access to the European market, farming in Wales has no future, because that is where our major market is. And anything that interferes with that is bad for Welsh farming. William Powell. <coughs> Uh, in accordance with the Member's Code of Conduct, I uh, um, alert uh, uh, the Chamber to the fact that uh, I am a partner in an upland, a small upland farming business in receipt of uh, CAP support. But uh, nevertheless, First Minister, you've often stated in this Chamber the importance of uh, the uh, CAP uh, to the sustainability and the future of Welsh farming. And one theme that came up uh, consistently last week at the NFU conference uh, in Llandrindod Wells was concern around the potential for delayed payments this year, partly as a result of uh, potential legal action, but, but also for any other reasons. And in this uh, context, First Minister, given the uh, unprecedented levels of indebtedness that there are in the farming sector at the moment and concerns out there also amongst the banks, will you consider convening um, a, a farm finance summit um, with yourself, um, your minister, the deputy minister for farming and food, key stakeholders in the finance sector and the farming unions to address this issue before it uh, becomes uh, a crisis? Well, I think what farmers want to see is action and payment. Uh, we know that the basic payment scheme will pay farmers uh, 200, that's roughly 200 million pounds uh, annually. Uh, we are looking to make BPS part payments of approximately 80% of the full payment to the majority uh, of farmers in December, with a vast majority of part payments made early in the new year. Uh, final part payments and the balance of payments will then be made by the end of uh, April. Uh, it may be, in some cases, where there is a probate issue, for example, that payment might take longer, but that is what we're on track to do. Question nine, Ali Roberts. Josh Lewis. Thank you, Presiding Officer. What steps have been taken in relation to the financial situation of Betty Cadwallader University Health Board, which is under Welsh Government special measures? The Welsh Government will be providing further support to Betsy Cadwallader University Health Board to ensure that it provides high quality and safe care to the people of North Wales, which is sustainable in the longer term. Thank you for that. I'm sure you'll recall that one of the reasons given for implementing special measures for the Health Board was problems in terms of financial management at the time and in June the board stated that 14.2 million would be the deficit for this year. By October, that's increased to 30 million. So what additional measures will you put in place as a government in terms of problems in terms of financial management? And can you give a commitment to the people of Wales that the health board won't be used, able to use measures that they've used in the past, namely actually cancelling treatments, particularly treatments which are commissioned in England to save money over the winter months. No, and it's very important that Betsy produces a plan which balances the services and secures balance regarding financial matters and this will be done as part of the action taken under the special measures and of course under those measures plans will be developed in order to ensure that the financial position is sustainable. Officer. Uh, First Minister, the situation is of concern to residents in North Wales, particularly in terms of the performance uh, of services in relation to waiting times for uh, particularly orthopaedics uh, and some other services. I wonder what specific targeted support 
the Welsh Government might be able to give to bring down the waiting times for orthopaedic surgery uh, in North Wales. Many people uh, have been waiting up to 52 weeks uh, for their surgery. Clearly that is unacceptable. It's leading to very poor quality of life for some and more serious conditions as a result when they finally do get their treatment. Uh, Bessie does well in, in certain areas in terms of cancer, it leads Wales in terms of stroke care and in terms, for example, ambulance response times are uh, amongst the best, if not the best, in, in the north of Wales. We expect, of course, the Health Board to allocate the appropriate level of resource in order that people do not have to wait an unacceptable time for any treatment, orthopaedic or not. Uh, um, Alan Fred Jones. Hello. Thank you very much. Along the same lines, waiting lists cause great concern there's a constituent of mine and i don't expect you to comment on the individual case was diagnosed with parathyroid in september 2013 and 2014 in september she was suffering hyperparathyroid which affects the other organs of the body now the specialist said that you need um surgery soon a year on she still hasn't received that surgery and she's still awaiting treatment now, is this acceptable to you, and do you believe that it's shortage of funding that's at the heart of the problem, or is it some other problem? Well, no, because if a doctor has told somebody that they need to have surgery soon, I would expect that surgery to happen quite soon and not uh, wait for a year. If you could give me more details in letter in a letter, then I could consider the case in greater detail. But if uh, I would expect that surgery to have taken place. David Rees. Will the First Minister make a statement on the support the Welsh Government has been providing to the steel industry in Wales? Well, we recognise the importance of the steel industry, of course, to the Welsh economy. And last week, the Economy Minister held a meeting with industry and trade unions representatives to continue discussions on what action can be taken to support the industry, uh, and uh, she will be updating members in the chamber tomorrow. Well, thank you for that answer, First Minister. And I welcome the work that's been done by the Welsh Government on this so far. But do you agree with me that the steel industry has been failed by the UK Government, both this one and the previous one, despite the numerous warnings that they received from the industry and from the Welsh Government, and the calls for actually urgent action in relation to the high intensive cost of energy and upon the uh, cheap imports that we are seeing here in Wales now. Uh, and will you raise this with the PM as a matter of urgency and a priority to ensure that we actually end up with a steel industry still in Wales and in fact even within the UK? Well, uh, you do get the impression and listening to the, the um, responsible minister in Westminster that steel isn't important. Uh, that this is seen as a, a relic of the past. Not for us in Wales, it's not. It's an important industry. Uh, I, I read with interest, for example, the comments of Professor Patrick Minford in regard to EU membership when he seemed to suggest that manufacturing wasn't important for the future late, late entirely in service industries. I don't accept that for one minute that that's where we should be going, to abandon our manufacturing base and our manufacturing heritage. Uh, it is true to say that there is pressure because of a glut of steel on the market. That much is true. Uh, and these are pressures that all steel producers face. But there is no doubt, and it, the steel producers themselves tell us this, that high energy costs in the UK are an immense problem in terms of, of competitiveness. It is absolutely crucial that the UK government takes action now to help not just the steel industry, but all our high energy uh, industries in order to make sure that they can be as competitive as other plants elsewhere in Europe. And that isn't the case, sadly, at the moment. Paul Davis. It's important, First Minister, that your government too does what it can to support the industry. Now, we've heard from politicians at all level just how crucial procurement is to the steel industry and the Minister for the Economy, Science and Transport is committed to strengthening um, procurement practices to support the steel industry more effectively in, respond to a cross -party, in response to a cross-party debate that took place in this place earlier this year. Now, given that procurement responsibilities are within your government's remit, and I do accept that the Minister will be making a statement tomorrow, can you tell us what specific steps the Welsh Government has taken since the debate in March of this year to strengthen procurement processes and to support the sector more effectively? Well, at present, we're reviewing the contractual the model contractual documents as regards the delivery of major transport projects for example in order to ensure that the bs standard is accepted and we are now looking at what the uk government has said about the procurement of steel that's something that we're considering at present but to be honest all we are doing is uh, 
adhering to what Value Wales are saying at present in order to ensure that the social and environmental conditions are considered when these agreements are made or these contracts are signed but where is the UK how much of the steel from the UK is used by the Ministry of Defence we don't know that and at present we are moving towards a situation where there won't be sufficient steel available within the UK in order to ensure that the departments of the UK government can use British steel so we must have a guarantee now that the United Kingdom government will deal with the high energy costs because if they don't do that I've been saying this for five years if they don't do that then there will be problems ahead so they have to do something now to help the workers of Wales. Um, First Minister, you'll know that the um, European Steel Summit took place in Brussels yesterday and you'll know also that um, many people in the sector and those who work in in the Patalba plant have said to me that they weren't very happy uh, with the outcome, um, which is what they see as the UK government contributing to the mishandling of this issue. Um, Do you share steel workers' concerns that granting China market status in spite of the country failing to abide by EU uh, rules on fair trade will make the dumping of cheap steel on European markets worse not better and have you or any of your ministers as you have indicated had any additional conversations to this end yes it's exactly one of the points of course that um, unfair trade practices are one of the problems that the industry faces we have the global overcapacity we know that but also those trade practices don't help Uh, we know for example that energy costs i've mentioned are an issue Uh, in terms of modernization of the steel industry that's important although tata following the visit that i made to uh, Mumbai and met with them, have invested hundreds of millions into Port Talbot, uh, an investment that happened as a result of that visit, and so that's something that, that, that we welcome. Uh, and of course, we have the European Globalisation Adjustment uh, Fund, which is also a factor. There is no one factor, but the factor that, w- that is within the control of the UK government is energy. You can't control the demand and the production for steel around the world, that much is true. But anything that improves the competitiveness of the Welsh steel industry, for example, Port Talbot against Eimuden in the the Netherlands has to be welcomed and that is not where we are at the moment and that does not bode well for the steel industry unless the UK government takes action. Peter Black. (coughs) Thank you, uh, President. First Minister, can I concur with you that anything that improves the competitiveness of the steel industry is important? Have you looked in terms of what the Welsh Government can do with regards to business rates as to whether you can do a small thing to actually help with that, although I know it's very small in comparison to the energy costs. Uh, Are there issues in terms of business rates which can specifically help Tata in terms of being more competitive? I know this is something the Minister is considering. Of course, we have to be careful that it's not seen as favouring one industry rather than another. Um, you know, that, that's important as well, but I, I take the point and it is something we're actively examining. It comes as a cost, uh, as members would, as a member would, would know. In terms of high energy costs, that doesn't come as a, get a cost to government particularly, and that's something that could be done now by the UK government. But we will do what we can, uh, particularly in terms of affordability, in order to help. But it is a drop in the ocean compared to what the UK government could do. Thank you, First Minister. We now move to item two.